Acts chapter 12, it's kind of interesting where we're at in Acts chapter 12. We'll give you some history. In the first part of the chapter, the first five verses, we get kind of a timeline. So we're in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread now in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem, and Passover is coming. If you remember, Passover is also when the crucifixion happened, so we are now a year removed from the death of Christ by Acts chapter 12. So there's been some stuff happen. I mean, we talked last week about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and the gospel now spreading into Africa. Stephen has been martyred and Stephen looks up into heaven and proclaims Jesus Christ even while he's being stoned. We have several disciples now by this time have either been, we see it, the Bible actually tells us in chapter 12 in the first couple of verses, the Bible says that Herod has now killed James, the brother of John, by the sword. James was one of the 12. If, you, if you've read the Gospels, you know that James was, was one of the three. When Jesus goes into the garden, he takes Peter, James, and John. When Jesus goes to the garden, or the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and, and Moses, and, a lot, and all this happens, there's Peter, James, and John. James is one of those, those, those tight three. And he's been now martyred by the sword. John is still out there fighting the good fight, and Peter has now been captured. Peter was a big fish to Herod because Peter was the one who stood up and proclaimed, this Jesus whom you crucified, as he looked at the religious leaders and the leaders of that day, and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people were saved, and they proclaimed it again, and 5,000 people were saved. They wanted Peter off the street because he was proclaiming this Jesus and people were following him in the way and, and this, the idea of the way would have been what they would have termed Christianity before it was termed Christianity. In John chapter 14, we see Jesus talking with the disciples and he's trying to tell them, hey, I'm going away. I'm, go, I'm leaving, They're, I'm leaving, but don't worry, somebody will come and, and comfort you once I'm gone. And, and Thomas says, how will we know where you're going? How will we know how to get to you? And Jesus gives him this very popular scripture where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. And so the idea of the way is what, that was the wording. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, they weren't first called Christians until it reached a, port, a, a region called Antioch, or a city called Antioch. That's where they were first called Christians, or, or little Christ, those that follow Christ. And so we see this way spreading and growing, and now because of Philip, it's in Africa, and because of other disciples, it's spread outside of Jerusalem. But Peter stays home. He stays in Jerusalem, kind of heading up the Jerusalem church and what's happening there. And so here we have in chapter 12... Bad news, because James, one of the inner three, has been killed, and Peter has been taken captive. And Herod makes a plan. He said, it's the unle- Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're going to wait till Passover, and we're going we're gonna to bring Peter out on Passover, which the idea was to send a message. Last year, we killed your Savior. This year, we'll kill your leader. And so that's where we are in history now. That's where we are in the start of the church. And so here's Peter. He's been taken captive. And Herod says, I want you to put four, four garrisons of guards around them, around Peter. Four. Now, these are Roman soldiers. They've been trained to do what they do really, really well. And Herod says, how big is your team? I want four of them. Where? On that guy. If I'm a soldier, I'm a, little, I'm a little concerned about being put on that detail when he asks for four, gar- four garrisons of guards. I want four of them, yeah, that's what I want. And I want them in the prison, outside the prison, and we pick up in chap- verse six, chapter 12, and we see the scenario they've put Peter in. It says, now when Herod was about to bring him out, this would have been on Passover. On that very night, let me clarify that also. Some of you go, wait, he's gonna bring him out, so that night, Our calendar, our days work different than the Jewish days did. And so for us, if I say on this very night, most of us would think that it means tonight. But a Jewish day started at 6 p.m. the day before. So when the sun went down was actually the start of the day. So Herod was going to bring him out this morning. And so on that very night would have been the night before. And so on that very night, here we find Peter sleeping between two soldiers 
bound with two chains, and there were sentries before the door, and they were guarding the prison. So this is how much they trusted Peter. They're going to chain him with two separate chains, and they're going to put him between two soldiers at all times. They were concerned. Why? Because if this guy gets out and gets loud, stuff happens. Stuff happens. How many of you like to be that guy? Like, right? I mean, I, I said, this is what I do as a believer and as a Christian. But imagining that I get to be like, that I could be like Peter and the world was afraid that when I spoke, stuff happened. The, 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 the change was going to take place. The things of God begin to move. You guys have heard me talk about Miss Virgie Simpson. She was an older lady in my church growing up. And Miss Virgie was one of those people. And the, my, the thing that just resonates in my mind about Miss Virgie is that statement, that phrase that she told me. She said, I pray, Vince, my prayer is that every morning when I wake up, and I used to get tickled because I always used to think she was going to say something about the sunshine or a smile or something like that. And she said, my prayer is that every morning when I wake up, all of hell shakes the moment my feet hit the floor. I'm like, that's what I want. That's, that was Peter. And so they were concerned that Peter was going to wake up. He's going to wake up. When he gets away, we're going to kill him tomorrow. So you watch him because we don't want him getting up. And so here's where he is. And I want to just share a couple of thoughts with you as this passage. We're going to stay primarily right here in Acts chapter 12. But it says, now when Peter was, or Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and the sentries before him and the doors guarding the prison. First thing I want to tell you is simply this, that God will find you where you are. How many of you know that God knew exactly where Peter was in the prison? How many of you have been at moments in your life where you have felt like or maybe even believed and thought, I don't know why God has left me. I don't know why God's leaving me alone. I don't know why it feels like I can't sense anywhere where God is. God knows where you are and he knows where to come and get you. So often in our life, in my life, I know there have been moments when I have got distant from God that I have, I have realized that in the trials of my life, they're not because I was pursuing God. The trials in my life came when I veered off of pursuing God. That's right. And he keeps searching for me. Yesterday we were at the park and I was there with Miss Bren. And Bren is my six-year-old. And Bren, if you ever get a chance to meet her, you will have a friend for life. That's just how she's wired. In fact, when she goes to a park, she is not concerned with learning anyone's name. She calls everybody friend. Hey. Friend. Hey, friend. Friend. And I figured out why she does it. So when one leaves her, all she has to do is go, hey, friend. And everybody in the park turns and looks at her. <laughs> and so she'll find one. So we're at the park and we're playing and, and she's playing with these little kids and they're running around. Well, there is this, there's this piece at the park that's got this kind of sail on it, this big wide piece of metal. It's attached to a bar here and attached to a bar here. And it has holes all through the sail. And Bren's running around, hey, friend, hey, friend, hey, friend, hey, dad. When no friend answers her, she calls her friend. <laughs> hey, dad, yeah, B. Dad, yes, B. Dad, what? <laughs> Any parents know of the, yeah. And here she is behind the sail with her face sticking through a hole. And she says, can you find me? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and I knew this sermon was coming today. And I sat there watching my little girl's face awkwardly stuck through that round hole, hollering at me, asking if I could find her, thinking about how my heavenly father sees me do the same ridiculous thing. <laughs> Listen through the trials, through the decisions of my life, through the chaos of my life, through the bad decisions, through the moments I don't follow him. And all this time I'm hiding behind a sail with holes in it going, Lord, if you could just see me. And he's like, I see you. <laughs> You're right there. I, I never lost sight of the offense. But isn't that how we do as believers? We start to feel like he can't see us or he's not watching us. And, and literally, it is that. And Peter here, and you know that Peter gets it because here he is, kicked back, <laughs> sleeping. But the Bible says he's sleeping between two guards. If I know I'm dying in the morning, 
I'm not sleeping much the night before. <laughs> Peter's sleeping between two guards. God knows where he's at. Hey, I want to tell you, I don't know what your prison is. I don't know if it's depression. I don't know if it's fear. I don't know if it's your marriage right now. And you say, yeah, it feels like a prison. That's not what I'm talking about. Let me just inform you something. If you're a person that says your marriage is a prison, you probably hold the keys that put you in it. That'll preach right there, but I don't have time. So, so whatever your prison is, addiction, you name it, whatever it is, God knows where you are and he knows how to get you out. He knows how to get you out. And so we see Peter here in prison. The Bible says he's in prison. He's got guards around him. He's sitting there, laying there in that place. And I want to I jump into the second part because I think it's really critical. The second part is this. Obedience removes obstacles. I'm learning something as I get older with obstacles. And, and as I think through Peter's walk here, is, and we see this, and I, I love this story, it says, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter on the side and woke him. Um, again, if I'm going to die in the morning, you're not going to have to nudge me to wake me up. The angel hit, and the word struck is not like, and the angel gently tapped him. No, it struck. Get up. It's that. He hit him with some force. Peter, hey, get up. Get up, get your, get, your, get your clothes on. Get your sandals on. Take your cloak, wrap it around you. And Peter's kind of, he's kind of foggy. Any of y'all ever slept so hard you wake up a little foggy? He's a little foggy. The Bible says it. It says, he says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. As he gets up, the chains fell off his hands. Peter, get up. Okay. And as he's getting up in obedience, the obstacles of the chains falls off. The angel didn't say, chains be removed. No, he said, get up. And when Peter got up, the chains fell off. I wonder in my life and your life, what we do with obstacles. Because here's what I find. I find that in obstacles, at least in my life, as, I, as I'm praying, God, give me direction. God, give me direction. God, give me direction. God, give me direction. Colin, God gives me direction. Come here. You're going to be my obstacle for me, buddy. Okay. Sorry. I, I. <laughs> so this is the obstacle that's in front of me. And what I find is that I find myself spending more time praying that God would remove the obstacle than asking God, is this the right direction? Because God may have put the obstacle there, so I don't go that way. But what I find is we've been so trained that we go, we got to pray this obstacle be removed. And what we are doing is just praying that we still get our own way. Rather than God shifting us and going, you know what? You can keep praying at the obstacle or you could simply turn left and have a free walk to where I need you to go. We see this in the New Testament when Paul is there and he has this dream about, he said, I'm going to Asia, I'm going to Asia. And the Bible actually says, I have made plans to go to Asia. And then the night before, Paul has a dream and there's a man from Macedonia in it. And the man from Macedonia says, come over here. And Paul goes, hey, we're not going to Asia. I'm going to Macedonia. Wait, we have plans. You know what? Making those plans, there were some things that came up and going this way seems really clear and that's the way we're gonna go. I wonder in your life what obstacle do you keep running into thinking you've got to defeat it when in actuality God's just telling you to turn away from it? Well, I just got to beat this. I got to get over this. I got to whip this. You, you may not have to. You may just have to remove yourself from it. I'm always going to like chocolate cake. <laughs> it's just a reality. Always going to like it. I don't know that I've ever met one I didn't like that I wasn't fond of in some way, shape, or form, Bob. And I can keep praying that God would give me power to overcome the chocolate cake or I can just not be around the chocolate cake. You see how we complicate this stuff so often with God? 
And if you'll trust and you'll be obedient when God says, turn away, turn away, turn away. Don't go, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. But God, I got to defeat this. No, you don't. If you'll trust me, I'll walk you away from it. And you may never have to face it again. And our stubbornness, we're so bent. We've trained ourselves to be so bent on winning. And we need to be obedient. Because that's where the win comes. The win isn't in the victory parade. The win is in being obedient on the front end and seeing what God wants you to do. And so Peter is obedient. God says, get up, put your coat on. Get your shoes on. Chains fall off. Okay. Keeps going. Pushed out. Acts chapter 12, verse 10. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, so Peter's stepping over the guards that he's sleeping next to, walking past the other ones. Weird. Get to a gate outside. And it opened for them of its own accord. And then they went out and went along the street and immediately the angel left him. (laughs) Peter's a little, he's he's still hazy. I'm going to tell you, the first, second, third, fourth, I don't know how long it's going to take you. But this initial walk of following Jesus, let me just be real honest with you. It's going to take you a bit. It's going to take you a little while to get used to following Christ. It's going to, it's not going to be natural right out of the gate. Can I get an amen on that from anybody? You're not going to get saved on Sunday and then wake up tomorrow and be like, whew, I just had 35 minutes of private quiet time in the morning and then I prayed at lunch and then we sang worship songs after dinner time. It was beautiful. That's liars if you do that. (laughs) And if you do it, it fades right? How many of you walked through the fade in your Christian life before? It fades. It takes us a while. It takes us a while to figure out that it's not just about the emotional moment of coming up out of the water, but this is a life that's been changed by Christ. And that there's weight to it. That there's responsibility to it. That there's work to it. Don't misunderstand what I just said. It's not the works that got it to you. But out of it come works. Out of it comes a life that we go, man, God's done this for me. I want to get back to him. So it's going to take you a little while. That's the next thing that I want you to see in here. It's going to take you a little bit. And he went out and followed him, and he did not know what was being done. This was Peter. By the angel was real. He thought he was just seeing a vision. Peter's a little, he's not really in it. He's like, I'll follow you. Step up. It's weird. He thinks he's dreaming. There are people that come into a service, they'll come into a revival service, they'll come into a baptism service, they'll come to a moment with God, and it just kind of feels like surreal. Last week, I'm going to tell you, we thought, staff was talking about it last week, and we were sitting there, and we said, man, we all went to lunch after church on Sunday when we could finally get to lunch, and literally all of us just stared across the table. What just happened? It's the 37 people baptized. My hips are cramping up from squatting at the baptistry, standing up, standing up, standing up. I'm like, what in the world? We just stared at each other. Being in that moment, we had one gentleman that just sat right where you're sitting back. Larry just sat there. He's like, <laughs> that was awesome. I'm like, you got anything else to say? N- no, no. It's just amazing to be a part of that. Those moments are glorious. But what do you do with that moment? You, you, got, you, got to do, you got to stay with it. We see Peter. He finally comes out of it and he starts to go, oh man, I got to give glory to God in this. God's just delivered. I'm supposed to die in the morning and God got me out. He knew where to find me. He removed the obstacles. That's the God I serve. That's who he's always been. Is this God who knows where to find me, who removes the obstacles. And I don't have to understand. It doesn't have to make sense to me. But I'm going to give him the glory. Look at the verse. It says in Peter, when he came to himself, said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. Catch this. And from all that the Jewish people were expecting, because I also want to be honest with you, it's going to take the people around you a little bit to get used to you being different. It's going to take them a little bit when you go, hey, I'm going to church. They're going again. Two weeks in a row? 
You okay? Hey, I'm going to life group tonight. What is that? It's a thing from church. More church? Is that a cult? We get that. It's amazing when you paint a ceiling black, what people call you. Hey, the world's not going to get you, but you shouldn't sweat that because Jesus told you that the world's not going to understand that. No, you're not. Jesus's words. No, you're not that this message that I bring will cause division. They're not going to get it. They're going to fight against you. Pastor Vince, I don't want to fight. I don't want to be in a fight. You are. I'm, I'm not going to apologize for you being in the fight because I'm going to tell you I need you. I need you. See, Justin, come here. Come here, Justin. See, there's going to be a day I'm in the fight and I'm deep in the fight. And I'm going to tell you, there's been weeks here recently where God has God has been beside me, but the enemy has come at me and attacked. And the reason I need you in the fight is because when I'm fighting this way, I need you right here. I need you. I need you having my back. Because see, the enemy doesn't fight fair, Bob. He doesn't fight. He's not, he's not going to fight me fair. And so if he's coming at me this way, I know for sure he's got somebody coming from behind me. But you see, I know Justin and Justin's got me. He's got me. He's going to pray me up. He's going to make sure that he's praying. Pastor, what, God, whatever Pastor Vince is dealing with, I got him. I've had people call me. Good, good people call me. Friends here in the church call me. Hey, I just want to pray for you, dude. I, I don't know what's going on. I don't have to know what's going on. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you. Because the world's not going to understand when you're in the battle, but you're in a battle. You say, what do I do when the world doesn't understand? We keep reading. That's what we do. In verse 12, it says, now, when Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary. This is Mark, the guy who wrote the book of Mark, his mom's name was Mary. Lots of Mary's in the Bible. But they went to his house where there were many people there together and they were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she ran back, leaving Peter at the gate. (laughs) She just left him. She's like, Peter's here. Peter, Peter's here. And they're like, girl. I mean, I don't know if they said it that way, but they said, no, it's, it's not Peter. You're just hearing things. No, I promise it's him. I heard his voice. I recognize his voice. And they're already defeated. They're like, no, it's his angel. They've already killed him. Check this out. Verse 16. Peter continued knocking. You want the world to know you're different? Keep knocking. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. Keep keep trusting God when obstacles come up. Keep trusting that God's going to find you when you need to be found. Keep trusting that he's going to provide for you when you need to be provided for. Keep trusting, and the world's going to start watching and go, that's something that I'm not used to seeing. That guy had his teeth kicked in by his life, by the decisions, by the things that he's walked through. Nobody should be around him, but he just keeps walking. He just keeps doing that. He just keeps getting up and knocking and going, this is who I am. I'm his. He's mine. I don't know anything different. You can judge me if you want. But somebody's going to open the door soon. And the Bible says they opened the door and were astounded. They were amazed. Why? Because what they thought wasn't true. Because what they thought wasn't true. You see, this sermon is not about Peter. Oh, I didn't see this last service. I wonder if we, the church, haven't become like the people in Mary's house who forgot God could still do stuff like this. I wonder if you're sitting there going, they can't change. They got too much broken stuff. They got too many pieces that have fallen apart. They got too much baggage with them. And I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just best that we remember the good things about them because that's what they would have done with Peter. Oh, he was there at Pentecost. He was there when he was there with Jesus. They'd have had all kinds of memorial stuff for Peter, but 
Peter showed up. Why? Because God kept showing up. I wonder in your life, two things. Maybe you're here and you feel like Peter and you're stuck in prison. I don't know what the prison is. I don't know. Some of it, maybe it's a doubt, prison of doubt. You're just not sure you can change. But Jesus knows where to find you. He knows how to come right inside that prison. Keep the guards quiet, open the gates, and walk you out into freedom. Pastor Vince, my prison is not that. I'm just struggling with relationships. He knows how to get in that prison, keep the guards quiet, walk you out, open the gate, and set you to freedom. Whatever it is, I don't know the prison, but I know the one that can set you free. Maybe that's you this morning, but maybe, maybe you're stuck in the house having Bible study, forgetting what God is capable of. Being content being called Christian, but not quite following the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to bow with me, church. What's he telling you? What's he telling you? Last week I said, what are you waiting on? And people came to the tank. This week, if that's your decision, that's what you feel like you want to do, that's great. We can do that. I got time. We'll make time. This week, today, do you need God to rescue you? Do you need Jesus to step inside the prison and start clearing a path for you? Do you need to come in and let him drop the chains off your hand? Do you need, to, do you need him to come in and wake you up, maybe shake you a little bit and go, hey, I'm right here and I've been knocking, I've been calling, I've been crying out for you and it's time you set aside this stuff and listen to what I'm saying. I got a plan and I got victory for your life, but you got to stand up. You got to put your coat on, put your shoes on, let's go to work. Is that you this morning? If it is, come on. If God's been chasing after you, trying to rescue you out on this morning, you meet him halfway and come on. Take a step forward. Let God do some freeing in your life. See what he's capable of. Maybe this morning you're a Christian and you've been this way for a while and you've just kind of got stale. You're good at the Bible study. You like the worship music. You're good at all that stuff, but you kind of forgot that God's able to shake a prison floor if he needs to. That he's able to deliver those in chains when he wants to. I don't know what it is, church. It's on you. Come on. God, remind me of what you're capable of. Remind me of what you're capable of, God. Remind me that you're still the one who parts seas. You're still the one that holds the sun into place, God. You're still the one that raises the dead. You're still the one. raises valleys of dead dry bones God it's still you and Lord whatever you need to do in me help me to keep knocking help me to keep knocking I'm not going to tarry I'm going to ask you one last time this morning if you believe God is trying to free you from bondage from guilt from shame if you feel like he's convicting you right now Come on, take a step forward. Let's see what he's capable of. Let's see what he's capable of. If you're here this morning, Christian, and you've grown cold, you've grown a little accustomed to the things of God. And maybe, just maybe, you've, you've forgotten the power of God, the miracles of God, the moves of God. Is that you this morning? If so, come on. God, keep me from being a skeptic. God, keep me from being somebody that just thinks it's this or that. And Lord, giving you the space to move in the way that you need to move. God, change my heart. Some coming. 
Is it you? Is it you? Father, like David prayed in Psalm 51, I pray that you'd renew a right spirit within us. That you'd cleanse us, God. That you'd strip away the junk, the stuff that we allow to cloud our hearts, that we allow to cloud our minds, God. That we would just see you clearly. That we would see you clearly, God, and, and we would trust that you can come and get it. You can find us, God. You know where to find us. In Peter's life, you found him on the raging sea when he was sinking. In Peter's life, you found him in a prison and you walked him out, God. In Peter's life, you found him in the pit after he had denied you and you called him back by name, God. You are a God who chases after us. Teach us to receive it. Teach us to respond and chase you back. Father, like Paul said, I have not yet, I have not yet caught that thing which has caught me. And Lord, I pray you'd keep the fire stoked within my soul. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen.